this lesson for the Cornet Project class asked the question, who moved my Calvinism? Uh, years ago, a book came out, Who Moved My Cheese? And it was quite alarming and it was required reading in the corporate world, that is. And I subtitled this, How to Escape the Maze of Calvinism. Dr. Walter Martin had written a book, The Maze of Mormonism. So I learned how to navigate, learned how to ask the question, define terms from him. So Calvinism, what is it? Uh, Redeeming God, that's a website, a small man-made system of theology, says Jeremy Myers. Eddie Johnson, a Corne colleague who works uh, tirelessly with me in collaborating, uh, he said it's a fallible soteriological construct. So in the past, my history uh, heard of the word Calvinism, Lutheranism, Arminianism, uh, never heard of Molinism, certainly didn't know what a Pelagius, uh, a Pelagian was. So when I went to seek this out to study it, thinking it was something there to study, uh, this is what uh, I realize so mental models. This is uh, from my world. Uh, we frame and build mental models, uh, somewhat like scaffolding. But it's a model uh, is an abstraction and or simplification of a system. And George Box says essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. And of course that happens when you're uh, doing trial and pilots. You're approaching a problem perhaps for the first time. So that's the approach I took. So the first rule is that you've got to have multiple models because if you have just one or two that you're using, the nature of human psychology is such that you'll torture reality so that it fits your models. Now that's trying to be right. And it's even mentioned in the Bible where people justify themselves before men and we seek out contemporaries. There's even a, a saying of birds of a feather flock together, something like that. So we seek consensus, we find comfort in that, but that is nothing to do with evaluating, uh, learning, and approaching something to ascertain true knowledge of it. So the models have to come from multiple disciplines because all the wisdom of the world is not to be found in one little academic department. That's Charlie Munger uh, from Kevin Wagonfoot Mental Models book. I have the uh, reference there. Uh, so in the seminary, for example, we would study uh, survey, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament history, New Testament history, homiletics, hermeneutics, apologetics, and then we also study the languages, Greek, Hebrew, we'd study lexography, how to use a lexicon, which is just a dictionary of a dead language. So you get the point. We would study a vast array of tools and acquire those for the purpose of applying them collectively to come out with the best result. The downside of mental models, however, said so the downside of mental models is that they can limit the way you see the world. Uh, that's true. Some can be downright harmful. There have been conflicts uh, between things uh, that involve people's identity, such as Calvinism. Those who identify with it seem to um, find a network, and then those who are Arminians find their own network. Uh, it could cost you if you're pastoring a church like I do. Uh, that's neither Calvinist nor Arminian, nor do we care to be. Uh, people have developed an ingrained model uh, to avoid or marginalize those who look different or speak a different language. So if you don't speak Calvinism, uh, people will uh, immediately marginalize you. And if you don't speak Arminianism, whatever it might be, this has become an identity, a culture of its own. Calvinism is the gospel, says Spurgeon. This is, is from Drew Mary. July 4, 2014. I don't know what his point was, but here it seems to be that if there is any doubt in anyone's mind as to whether or not the so-called Prince of Preachers was a Calvinist, let the following quotation taken from his sermon settle it in your mind. So Spur Spurgeon was most definitely a Calvinist. Of course, I know people that uh, have read other things Spurgeon said, and he obviously uh, contradicted himself on many occasions, was even quite alarmed at the notion that regeneration would precede faith, and uh, he panicked, if you will, in one of his sermons, speaking of the preaching of the gospel is to take life to the uh, sinner and not to uh, presume that the person would have to have life first before you preach the gospel, but that's another point. So that was an appeal to authority. Uh, for example, a famous person, you do that to bypass critical thinking, it's like someone telling us, accept this because some authority or celebrity like Spurgeon said it. 
Calvinism is not the gospel, back to Jeremy Myers. He says, I deny Calvinism, but I uphold the gospel because Calvinism is not the gospel. Uh, also, Joel Webbin of uh, Right Response Ministry says Calvinism is not the gospel, which is refreshing to hear someone uh, acknowledge that who has such a scholastic background. That honor belongs to Jesus Christ alone, even if Calvinism were true. The most that could be said of it is that Calvinism is one small aspect of the gospel. Now, I don't know what it would be. But to equate Calvinism with the entirety of the gospel is to replace the infinite glory of Jesus Christ with a small man-made system of theology. Such an idea is completely contrary to the Reformation principles of solus Christus, Christ alone, and soli deo gloria, God's glory alone. There's a link to that. Uh, so let's look at the first one. Here's some maze. I just took this image and used it for the uh, purpose of teaching. Total hereditary depravity, first step to escape. So define the term. That's what we were trained to do in the seminary. That's what I was trained to do when I was at, involved in the Christian Research Institute under Dr. Walter Martin. That is, you could hear and listen to his teachings. I think it was by radio. Uh, notice that the term depravity is not in the Bible, the King James Bible specifically. And yes, we've all heard it a thousand times. Rapture's not in the Bible. Rapture's not in the Bible. And we've heard people counter that by saying, well, neither is Trinity. And that's just another exercise in futility. But notice it's not there. So the fallible religious construct Calvinism has no lexical definition for its cornerstone feature called depravity. Now, if the T is not established, then nothing else uh, is effectual in the construct or the tulip, as they call it. So you go to Genesis 2.9, which is what this class, the Cornet Project class did, and ask, what is the lexical definition of the term evil? Since that's where we found the problem. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of the knowledge of good and depravity. So what mazes like Calvinism are made of? Well, mazes are made of uh, mental constructs, negative externalities. It just keeps growing. When unforeseeable uh, things occur, you just assimilate it into the uh, maze as uh, I've often laughed at the idea that uh, resistance is futile when you're dealing with this ever-growing, expanding maze called Calvinism. But it's not deliberately designed to frustrate others. The frustration can and often does exasperate a non-Calvinist. The non-Calvinist might not notice that the process of escape is also unknown to the Calvinist. Step one, so 20% of the escape is over when you go to Genesis 2.9 and then search for the term evil in the Koine Old Testament, that's the Koine Greek, and you will notice the term for evil is G4190. When you notice this term, it will lead you directly to the Savior's use of the term in Matthew 7.11. And I remind you, Savior refers to the Deliverer, the Messiah, and he will definitely find no difficulty uh, navigating you out from any maze. Jesus Christ the Deliverer does not find the maze of Calvinism be too hard. After all, the Bible asks, is anything too hard for the Lord? Of course not. Escape the five points and five steps. First, define the term depravity. Genesis 2.9c, the tree of the consequence, to have noticed and continue to notice. That's G1492. And then a noticeable thing, I'm sorry, a knowable thing, and that's of good and of evil. Note, we can research later the phenomenon behind the supplanting of the term evil with depravity. And yes, I did make a mistake by placing notice there for no, and that's because I'm fallible. Now I'll go to Matthew 7, 11. Since therefore you yourselves, while being evil ones, there's the word evil ones, poneroi, same one, G4190 from the Koine Old Testament, have noticed and continue to notice there's G1492 also. Striking, isn't that in Genesis 2.9, we have both G4190 and G1492 to be giving good gifts to the children of you all. Now we know that while being evil men, we have noticed both the knowledge and the insight and continue to notice not only of what is good, but also how to be doing it, as in Jesus' example, giving good gifts to our own children. So from where would the idea that man lacks both the ability to notice and know what is good as well as how to be doing it originate? Well, that came from the maze of Calvinism. When you begin a construct and then you have to then explain it, it, it grows. It's called accretion. It just continues to expand.
So the T in the tulip is undefined. That's a relief if you're not aware of the fact that the person speaking of the word depravity constantly uh, discusses the concept, uh, but it, the person in the discussion, perhaps, let's say you're in a debate with someone who identifies as a Calvinist or wishes to defend it, you might not know to just stop and say, before we proceed, could you define the term itself? And that would be quite difficult. Uh, but not utter, this is where we get the idea of total depravity, but not utter depravity. You'll hear those things a lot. This only makes sense if you don't think about it. Also, the, here's the uh, if and then that will happen. If total hereditary depravity is true, then mankind is totally unable to believe even the gospel without first being regenerated. So notice the apodosis, the then part of the if-then conditional sentence. Uh, it's assumed. So the protasis, that if part, if total hereditary depravity is true, and then the apodosis is presumed. So presumptions are made when you begin to draw conclusions when a term has not even yet been defined. So now this is where orthodoxy is established. People begin to move you out of the uh, realm or domain called orthodoxy. And they say, well, he doesn't believe total hereditary depravity because he doesn't accept that man is totally unable to believe even the gospel without first being regenerated. And you'll notice that is what you can't notice. You don't notice that the gospel is now made irrelevant here. It's not the means by which a person is persuaded to believe. That's what's left out of the equation. And you can notice this. That's why Calvinism literally makes the gospel disappear. Uh, the U, unconditional election, second step to escape this maze. Unconditional election, elect means reasoned out from. Literally, those are the parts of the word when we go through the Corne text. The question for the reader is reasoned out from what, or in this case, from whom? For example, in Ephesians 1, 4, Paul stated, just as he reasoned us out for himself, and that's from those already in Christ Jesus, in him. So Paul was reasoned out from those already in Christ. Recall that Jesus did as, a, as recorded in Luke 6, 13. Uh, here's what he did. It says, and when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. Now, these are people who already believe. And of them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. So from that larger group of disciples, people who had already believed and were now followers of Christ, he chose 12 of them. If you are one of the elect, you can't that can't be known whether or not you are. So within the maze of Calvinism is added the unknowable condition for eternal life, which Calvinists call election. Now that's their term election. It's their term depravity, just as I learned uh, studying uh, Dr. Walter Martin's research is that Mormons say Jesus, other people say Jesus, <laughs> and dealing with a Mormon professor, high scholastic, who misled me by using the jargon, he would say Jesus and salvation, and then I know he was laughing uh, in his, uh, silently laughing at me, noticing that I was having a conversation with him as though we agreed with anything, and the whole time he knew he was speaking of uh, Jesus, for him, was a totally different person than Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man in the Bible. He later admitted it. Uh, Kenneth Gentry, for example, a high Calvinist, rejects that anyone can have assurance that he is one of the elect, the Calvinist condition for eternal life. In the article titled, When Assurance is Not Assurance, one can read about Kenneth Gentry's argument against assurance as well as notice the statement, nowhere in the Bible do we learn, for instance, that Ken Gentry is among the elect. And there's the Link to this article at faithalone.org. Step two, 20% of the escapes now behind us. We notice that the T in tulip is undefined. So uh, total hereditary depravity means whatever the Calvinists say it means. You can't pull out your lexicon. You can't do interpretation. You can't do uh, hermeneutics. You can't be uh, involved in lexography because the Calvinists have already told you what it means. You just go find enough scriptures, bundle those up, and say that looks like what we're talking about. So we notice that election in the maze of Calvinism is unknowable. Now, I had never heard of that. I didn't even know there were people out there that said such things. Of course, and I did not engage the computer that is internet until 2010. So it was quite a rude awakening to go and engage that cyber world and find how far removed things were from any reality that I had uh, assumed myself to have known. Wherefore, we can now notice that 40% of the maze of Calvinism thus far is undefined and unknowable or unknowable. It contains no reality that is Bible truths according to which one might know. 
And here's limited atonement, third step. First, the Bible teaches that atonement is for sins, 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Notice the sins of the whole world so that we don't need to just play with the word world as you'll hear people banter back and forth about what does it mean, the word world. We have an unusual term there, the whole world, and we also have not for our sins only. And then we have propitiation is in relationship to the Father. Jesus' death satisfied the Father for all the sins of the entire world. Atonement for all men, the atonement conciliated the Father. We understand the scriptures to teach that the death or sacrifice of Christ has reference to two things, in reference to God and then in reference to those who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ for everlasting life. There's a link there at the Baptist History homepage. You can read that. Another negative externality. Now, this is unforeseeable. Supporters of Calvinism cannot know if Jesus died for their sins. That's striking because the first three steps in your exodus from the maze of Calvinism, we notice there's no lexical definition for Calvinist term depravity. There's no ability to know if one is elected unto eternal life, an unknowable condition of eternal life, which that's amazing. You can never cross that hurdle. You can never cross that divide. Jesus might have come from heaven itself, come to be flesh, dwelt among us, came to seek out and reveal the Father to us and give us the good news that all who are believing in him already have an everlasting life. But this is now a barrier that prevents that reality from communicating and being experienced, which is remarkable because uh, knowing that Jesus is the king of the kings, who would presume that they could place some type of condition that would prevent him from uh, decreeing to people and saying, truly, truly, I am decreeing to you all, the one who is already believing into me is already having everlasting life. And why would we have to know any more than that of which we've been persuaded to be true that those of us who believe Jesus Christ for everlasting life are already having it? So you can read this, but notice the negative externality. Develop an unscripted view of election called unconditional and thereby cause an unknowable condition of eternal life. That is an, something they didn't foresee. So then they have to go back, and now you can see how the maze just continues to grow. So by developing an unscripted view of atonement, another negative externality emerges, namely that no one can know if Christ died for their sins. And if you were to tell a believer or try to convince me that I can't know that Jesus died for me, uh, that was the core of what persuaded me uh, to believe everything he's ever told me, everything he's ever said, especially when he said that but if I believe him for everlasting life, I'm already having it. So irresistible grace. Let's move on to that one. Uh, Acts 7.51. This is often used to refute irresistible. And of course, there's all types of banter about it. But Stephen said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye. Now, what uh, the definition of resist the Holy Ghost in that text was in verse 52, where he said, which of the prophets did you not persecute? Jesus taught about the rich man and Lazarus and said in that lesson, quoted Abraham, who told the rich man, since they are not listening to Moses and the prophets, then they would not be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. That, that uh, believeth not the Son is actually negating persuasion by the Son. Isn't that interesting? We're persuaded by the Son. We're persuaded by the gospel. Uh, here, 1 Peter 4, 17, C, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Obey not the gospel actually words out as the ones who are negating persuasion by the gospel of the God. Now, that's the Father of Jesus Christ, and that's the gospel of the grace of God, the Father of Jesus Christ. The God is the Father of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 3, 2, unthankful ones is from G884. It's an adjective, nominative, masculine, plural for those of you in this Corne class, and it's from uh, this word, akaristos, and the letter A in front is a negation. Karistos is the word grace. And you'll now notice that if we were to word that out as an adjective to modify a person, we would be saying a grace negating one. So we can see that grace is very susceptible. Uh, and that's all according to God's discretion, how patient he is willing to endure. As we noticed in the Bible, even someone like Jezebel, he, Jesus said to her, I gave her time that she might change her mind, repent. 
but she did not. So that's true what he did. He actually gave her actual time with a true purpose. And all we should know is that it, the Bible is uh, trustworthy and we can trust and believe every word it says, especially when Jesus talks. Perseverance of the saints. Let's go to this fifth step. It says that people who fall away into error or belief, unbelief, never truly believe to begin with. Uh, that's an easy answer. It's just not true. In effect, uh, perseverance of the saints advocates typically advocates typically teach that you are born again or justified by a continuous. So you're believing, and then you get into Jesus sometime. Uh, that's not in the scriptures. We go to the high scholastic Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit Himself. Uh, however, Paul said we believed, puncture action, simple form of action, into Jesus Christ. That's an aorist past, for example, but it's a simple form of action in order that we might be justified out from Christ's faithfulness. Notice it's not our faithfulness. Uh, that is a one-time simple form of action, not an ongoing action. Perseverance of the saints uh, translates into a saving faith. Also, the faith of the elect is defined as one that is a saving faith because it always produces good works. This faith, they say, which is given only to the elect, is saving faith, which must also be the gift of faith that God only gives to the elect. Now we're going in a circle again. He only gives it to the elect, but you can't know you're the one of God's elect. You certainly don't know if you'll endure to the end. Also, and most recently, uh, includes striving to obtain something that's now been invented, final salvation, which can be lost. So you must endure to the end. So at this point, uh, I'm starting to realize that Calvinism may just be a form of hyper-Arminianism. Final salvation is for the persevering only. Uh, there is a holiness without which we will not see the Lord. Essential to the Christian life and necessary for final salvation is the killing of sin and the pursuit of holiness, mortification of sin, and sanctification of holiness. That's John Piper, who teaches uh, works for salvation and has invented and gone along with something called final salvation. Uh, what makes faith, saving faith, is works. This is a quote from John Robbins all the way back in 2003 when he was refuting John MacArthur's book, The Gospel According to Jesus Christ. And he says, anyone, and I've included even John Piper, who agrees with MacArthur's interpretation of James, must say the same thing. The thing that makes faith, saving faith, is works. Now, isn't that remarkable? We believe Christ is the object of our faith. The gospel is what we believe. When you believe the gospel, you are believing Jesus. When you believe the scriptures and you believe what Jesus said, you are believing Jesus. And the gospel that speaks only of Jesus Christ is that which persuaded us to believe. And the moment we believe, we received everlasting life. We're born again. And once we're fathered, the Bible says we're always being fathered. And that's definitely striking. That, uh, But Mr. Robbins goes on and says that is pure Romanism and pure humanism. The conclusion is logically inexorable. If the reader does not like the conclusion, he should reread James and figure out where he has misunderstood what James says. I like that. So there is actually, in truth, there is no maze from which to escape. Uh, when the first point is undefined, then you don't have any uh, structure to find yourself uh, accordingly confined. Uh, the second one's unknowable election. So again, we have uh, undefined, now unknowable, and then the L, limited atonement, means there's unknowability for whom Christ died. So now we can't know for whom Christ died. And if you say, well, he died for the elect, but then you say, but you can't know if you're one of the elect. And then you say, well, man can't believe even the gospel, which is the gospel that persuades a person to believe, which is a striking thing if you're not aware of that. And then four ignores the grace negating one, the negation of persuasion by the gospel of the grace of God, negation of persuasion by the Son, and resisting the Holy Ghost by persecuting the prophets. So I don't know what to say about that. And then uh, final salvation remains unknowable until one has endured to the end. Of course, endures what? That text in Matthew is referring to uh, tribulation and the pressures and the trials, and yet Jesus taught to flee persecution. So you have a blessed day and enjoy this lesson. I hope it helps you. Uh, not take Calvinism so seriously, but if you do take it seriously, do so by looking and seeking out a lexical definition for depravity. Uh, understand what do they mean when they say election. Understand what it is they're saying. You might be surprised that not even they are aware of what they're saying. So have a blessed day.